So would you join me in welcoming Professor Mark Ritson to the stage. Hello. It's lovely to be here. Um, hello, Melbourne. So my topic today is media in the 2017 year that now uh, confronts us, finding a place for radio in what will probably be one of the most challenging years without any hyperbole, really, in the history of advertising and, and, and mass media. The, the experts at PwC do a very nice report, as you probably know, looking at the breakdown of where advertisers in Australia spend their money. And as you can see, last year, we, uh, as advertisers, spent almost $15 billion in this country. And the share of pie, as you can see, I'm sure most of your eyes are pulled straight away to the beautiful yellow of radio, where you're pulling about an 8% share. But also, probably your eyes are also drawn to that threatening orange of the digital media encroachment, which grows, at a, as we know, a tremendous rate, uh, faster and faster. And in fact, by 2020, although the size of the pie will increase, as you can see, we will have passed the threshold where more than 50 cents in every dollar spent on advertising in this country is going to digital media. And that digital media will be divided really by two large organizations, Facebook and Google, who will take around 75% of that total amount. And PwC are rarely wrong. It's going to happen. And as you can probably also see, your, your own share of, uh, of the pie will diminish to 7%. So you know what the headlines will be in 2017 as we head into this year, and what the media and marketing and business press will say. They're going to talk, as they already have done, about the massive growth of Facebook. They're going to also talk increasingly about the incredible numbers that Google are able to do. They'll even start mentioning that Instagram are smashing it because they are. The danger is, of course, the narrative on radio is likely to be something along the lines of, you guys are totally <laughs> fucked. And in fact, when I was putting this presentation together, I, I toyed with several different titles. One of the titles I thought I might use was, rather than finding a place for radio, which is a little bit sort of, you know, boring, originally I was going to go with, how fucked are you lot? <laughs> with a sub-message, very fucked. <laughs> I'm joking, uh, sort of, as we'll see, okay? So let's look at these big numbers of digital, and then we'll come back to radio. So they are big numbers, and they're stunning given how quickly they've emerged. Uh, Twitter uh, has more than 300 million followers globally and about 2.8 million here in Australia. Facebook has broken 1.7 billion active users, 15 million of whom are here in Australia. And even Instagram has now broken half a billion users, counting about 5 million of those again in this country. These are gigantic numbers, partly because they play the global numbers cleverly, but also because they're big numbers. Let me show you some smaller numbers that will give you some hope for the year ahead. And, and let me be a little bit more balanced in how we present them. So uh, in Australia, there is a, uh, a famous uh, brand valuation company called Brand Finance. They calculate the value of brands. And this year for 2016, as usual, they've worked out what are the 10 most valuable, biggest brands by brand equity in this country. Here's the list with Telstra at the top, followed by Woolworths and so on. So this is an objective list of the biggest brands in this country. Now I'm going to take BHP and Rio Tinto out of the list when we look at digital media because they don't do a lot of digital, they're not B2C, and it wouldn't be fair to have them in the numbers. So let me take them out, and then let's look at what's really a de facto list of the eight big consumer brands in Australia. When you look at their digital media presence, it's impressive. Facebook, as you see, has in some cases more than a million uh, likes among certain brands here, Coles. Uh, Twitter, in some cases more than 100,000 followers for Telstra. And even Instagram, which is a newer uh, platform, some very impressive numbers. And when you first look at these, they can be overwhelming and intimidating. But I don't care about these numbers and neither should you or the clients that I work for or you work for. I want to look at the customers of these brands and then look at what proportion of them are using social media. That gives you a different picture. So here I've, I've worked out from secondary data the actual customer base size of these respective brands. As you can see, Telstra has more than 16 million customers. And now what I'd like to do is to look at the proportion of their customers 
who are using these digital channels as a form of communication. The Facebook numbers come down significantly. Only 2% of Telstra's customers uh, like the brand on Facebook. The Twitter numbers turn into what we call often in statistical training, two-fifths of fuck all. <laughs> and Instagram turns into zero. Now, this is curious, is it not? These are small numbers, very small numbers. And even the Facebook one, I could have liked something from Coles five years ago and be in that list right now. If you look at recent activity over the last seven days, they come down to nothing as well. Not as big a threat, at least at the organic level, as we might have first imagined. Now, I know some of you struggle with complex numbers like percentages. You work in production and creation. So um, here it is presented in a, uh, in a graphical format. The number of customers have engaged with the average big brand on Facebook. Yeah? How about this one? The number of customers who follow a brand on Twitter. If, if you're struggling, it's that, it's that arm there. You see that arm there? No, seriously... Twitter sucks. Twitter sucks, man. Look, here's, I went around last night, all of those top eight brands, and I looked at their latest tweet and how many people had liked or retweeted it. They're tiny numbers. Look, uh, Optus got 19 people to retweet their latest tweet. 19, one nine, yeah? Uh, Combank got one to retweet their latest Twitter, right? Uh, Westpac, five retweets. Here we go, Woolworths. We have a pen, we have an apple. And we have pineapple. But we haven't got any fucking followers because we got one retweet. <laughs> Coles, one. Uh, ANZ, two. NAB, six. Telstra, seven. It's not as impressive as we've been led to believe in the media, is it not? I mean, I spend a bit of time on Twitter, often drunk. Uh, I tweeted a picture of a man with giant golden balls last week for reasons that I can't now remember. I got nine retweets. That beats half of these brands here. <laughs> We're talking about minibus-sized audiences. But all of these companies have social media teams. In many cases, they have more people in the teams than they have responding to their tweets. <laughs> Which prompts the question, why don't they just use the telephone and ring people up during the day? It would be more efficient. And Instagram... Customers who follow a brand on Instagram, this one's very tricky, especially in that little, you have to look really carefully, can you see? It's just, wait, wait, it's just there. You see that, that little fingernail there? <laughs> they've built it up. They've sold a medium that's very successful, but they've built it up in the media so big in Australia that we overstate it to some degree. But perception is reality when you're dealing with advertising budgets and marketers. So let's contrast that with poor old radio. So... In the last week, this is the proportion of customers that would have listened to the radio. It would be, as we know, between 94 and 96% of the Australian population. I know you know that because you work in radio. No one I work for in the client world knows that. They think you're dying. Yeah? And here's the number that will engage and talk about the things they heard this week on radio, almost half of them. It's a vibrant, successful social medium. But it's not being sold as well as it could be against what's, frankly, this gigantic... Uh, force of bullshit that represents digital. But you might be saying at this point, but this does not fit with what I'm being told in the business media and what I'm regularly informed is going on about the rise and rise of digital. Uh, and there's a reason for that. So when you get on tonight, just in case you're not sure I'm not bullshitting you, try and find out how many brands the average Australian follows on social media. Yeah, you won't be able to work it out because it, it's very hard. But you've put it into Google, you can spend as many hours as you like. And you'll get lots of articles about how wonderful social media is and how followers are at the core of success. You just won't get a number. And you won't get a number because it's really, really small. To illustrate, um, take me, right? I'm not that famous, despite what my delightful introduction might have led you to believe. I'm a relatively bog standard middle aged marketing professor, right? Um, I have 45,000 followers on Twitter. Now, one of the reasons I have 45,000 followers on Twitter is I bought 15,000 one night when I was drunk, but I still have $600, best thing I ever did. Uh, I have 30,000 genuine followers, or as genuine as marketing people get, right? Those 30,000 followers mean that I have more followers on Twitter than Bendigo Bank, Breville, Bow Repairs, VB, BT, Tim Tam, Suncorp and Kmart. How is that possible? 
How can one relatively anonymous dude have more followers than these quite large brands? Oh, you know what? I've made an error. I've made an error there. Sorry. I've got more followers than those companies combined. Oh, you know what? I'm still not finished. Times two. <laughs> what the fuck is going on? This isn't what was sold to you. Yeah, to our clients. So how many brands do Australians follow? I'll tell you, because I know. It took me a long time to find it out. There's one piece of data. Experian last year, a fine market research company in a survey, asked a representative sample of Australians, approximately how many brands do you follow on social media? Not just Twitter, on social media. How many brands? And you can see here the totals are split out. Can anyone calculate the average? What's the average number? I'll give you a clue. You can't. You can't. Because Experian inexplicably took out the most common response in the survey. It was the people in the survey that said, none. You know how many people said, I don't follow any brands on social media from a representative sample of Australians? 66%. Two thirds of the Australian population. Now here's two interesting questions for you. First of all, you ever seen that data before? Second of all, why would Experian not put the most common number in the table? Because the ideology, the hegemony, the propaganda around digital is such that you don't want to mess with it. And I wasn't sure myself. So I actually went out and got the data. I paid a research panel company, the online research unit, to repeat the questions from a representative sample of Australians. I got 64%. Don't follow any brands. It's an interesting, interesting observation, particularly when you put it in contrast to what radio is able to do every week in terms of its reach and in terms of its ability to reach out to almost every Australian on the planet. So I have a theory at this point, and this is where it's going to get complicated. I have a PhD in marketing, so I'll take you gently through this, right? I think social media is a social media, yeah? I think for me and you, it's a tremendous medium. I think when brands get involved, it's a very bad fit. Yeah? If you look at the definition of social, relating to society or people or organization, and medium, a medium of cultivation, conveyance or expression, I think we know what social media is, and it works brilliantly. But when brands get involved, things aren't so brilliant. Think about what this tells you, and it's statistically sound. In this room, if you were all consumers, many, many brands would want to get their hands on you with their social media strategies, and you would choose just to follow one brand, is what the data tells us, actively on social media, and ignore all the others. And in fact, the modal number for most Australians is none at all. They wouldn't follow any. It's interesting. In contrast, radio has always been and remains a medium designed for brands. Its DNA is interlinked with brands with sponsorships, and with consumers, to some degree, welcoming brands into the radio medium. Some of the data from last year, two-thirds of radio listeners are open to advertising being present within radio. So the presence of ad-blocking software wouldn't work as well on radio because there's a genuine positivity towards it. Nearly three-quarters of radio listeners have been made aware of new brands from radio. They learn about new stuff, something you share with newspapers. Yeah. Digital media is great in some cases, but rarely a place where we learn new things. At the top of the funnel is where radio and other media can play. And finally, two-thirds increase their knowledge of brands after hearing about it in radio ads. It's a great medium for brands. I'm just not sure how many brand managers think it or will keep thinking it as we go through this digital revolution. Have you ever noticed how you're presented as an industry in the marketing and media press. It's a source of great amusement to me, um, and I'm sure annoyance for you. Like, if you ever get any articles on social media, you get this young, alert, sexy, hard-bodied bunch of young people who look cool and smashing and everything else. And then when anyone ever talks about radio or does an article about it, you get old Dr. Death here, <laughs> tuning into Radio Boring, you know what I mean? It's terrible. It's terrible, but it captures perfectly how they misrepresent radio and the vibrancy of the industry. And it's exactly the same when they talk about the tools, right? Whenever they talk about Facebook or Twitter, it's always like dynamic shots and people are doing stuff and are zooming on the screen. And whenever there's anything on radio, you get some ancient old fucking radio set from the 1920s, and that's what represents the industry. It's a real problem. And it's going to get worse. 
It's been bad so far, but when the tsunami of bullshit, which is digital video, finally crashes properly into the shores of Australia, it's already starting to crash, but there's a lot more bullshit to come, trust me. Radio, like all the other non-digital mediums, will find itself struggling in a tsunami of nonsense, a tsunami of numbers which will befuddle and entrance clients. Let me give you the first taste of the tsunami, which started in 2014. So ESPN, the US uh, TV network, um, had the, all the rights to the World Cup, the Soccer World Cup in Brazil. And so they broadcast all of the tournament, which lasts for 30 days, on TV and on smartphone and digital platforms. Okay? And at the end of the tournament, they, they announced their numbers. They'd got an audience of 4.6 million people to watch the games on TV and 115 million people to watch it on their digital appliance. And that sparked, as you might imagine, enormous coverage about, oh, the future of TV and sport is all digital, TV's screwed, everything's over and with this. You've got to be careful. You've got to watch out, because there's sprinklings of bullshit everywhere with digital video. This is not an apples-to-apples comparison. This is an apples-to-orange-skins-filled-with-horseshit comparison. (laughs) No, I'm, I'm not joking, right? Look, very similar to radio audiences, this is measured, this 4.6, as an average minute audience. At any time during the tournament, the average number of people watching the game on TV was 4.6 million. This number on the other side, 115 million, if you saw a man in a shirt running down some grass for three seconds, ka-ching, you're in that audience for the rest of the month, my friend. You're, you've just done a digital view, you're in the 115 million, right? That's not apples to apples. That's digital views. Now, what happens if you take the digital views and turn them into proper measurements, not bullshit ones? So what happens if you calculate, as Nielsen have done, helpfully, what that digital view number, 115, what it would count as if it was measured properly as an average audience uh, by the minute? And the answer is, if you translate it, 300,000 views. Bullshit. It's bullshit, right? or about another incremental 7% of the audience. Now, let's be clear, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with getting an extra 7% of the audience, that's great, but it's a little thing. It's a little, little thing. And TV is a big thing, like radio, but it's being talked about like it's a little thing. Now, what happens if I take the 4.6 million who watched it on TV and turn it into a digital view? Alas, Nielsen did not make that calculation. I would love to give it to you, but... About a week later at the upfronts, uh, the channel behind The People vs. O.J. Simpson, which as you know has been one of the most successful TV shows here and also back in America, they did do that just to stick it up the digital industry. They said, we got 12.6 million views, average views, for our TV show in America. But if we turn that into a digital view, it translates into 259 billion views. This is a dirty game, and you will lose because of it. Because you know what you do, what you've got all wrong here? You measure audiences properly. It's a massive error. Massive error. (laughs) My message to you is not all M's are created equal. We've all known from the day we started working in media that CPMs vary. Of course they vary, by channel, by station, by time slot. But it's time to stop looking at the C and look also at the M. A thousand was never a thousand. If you tell me, you know, five million people tuned into Hamish and Andy, we know not all five million listen to the ads. Same with TV. There's always been that little cleansing error. We know it. But the degrees of freedom now going on off these thousand for the digital metrics, you must be very careful because they're not being presented straight. To demonstrate what I'd like to do now, and I haven't checked with anyone, but I'm going to do it anyway, is I'd like to cancel the rest of the conference. And what I'd, no, I do. I want to, and, and make the most of this big screen. So I would like us to just have the rest of the morning to watch David O. Selznick's 1939 classic, Gone with the Wind, okay? I know, I know, indulge me. Um, it's a big screen, it's a beautiful sound system, it's a beautiful film, if you haven't seen it already. Uh, so sit back and enjoy. I don't know who's speaking next, but someone can wheel them off and, and you know, get them out. <laughs> they can watch it if they want. Um, So let's go. You ready? Gone with the wind. But I I would point out to you, this is going to be the digital view version rather than the traditional version, which, you know, it's all 20th century shit. We're going to do the digital view version, which I think you'll find is more exciting. So sit back and enjoy Gone with the Wind. Because that's a digital view. Yeah? 
Three seconds will qualify you as having seen a video, and that will do it nicely. Um, three seconds is, according to Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, a full viewing of a film or ad or show. Um, and in fact, that's a little bit exaggerated, because as we now know, 85% of the video, at least on Facebook, is watched without sound. So for this to really work, we'd have had to have watched that film without any sound at all for the three seconds I would have shown it to you. And in fact, even that's, frankly, just a little bit positive, because... Most of the digital views are watched with only a few pixels visible to the viewer. So in reality, you'd have got three seconds with no sound in the top right-hand corner of the screen, and that would have been your digital view. I'm not making this up. That's a digital view. And of course, I'm still being a little bit too fair on digital. Some, many of the audience for the digital media are not real human beings. They're bots, yeah? Now, there's many different assessments of how many bots are out there. Google's own estimates were at 60% a few years ago, so 60% of your audience isn't human. I've picked, because it's you, a particularly pessimistic view published last year that estimates the number of bots, at least for clicks, averages around 97%. The red is the human, by the way, for the different platforms. Now, I think that's a little extreme. Somewhere between 60% and 96% is the number of bots that are actually pretending to be the audience. Again, something we don't talk about a lot in the media community in Australia. Now, to be fair, that's clicks. Video watching, the best independent estimates are around about a quarter of all the video audience is a bot. So again, for me to properly have shown you Gone with the Wind, the digital view version, it would have had to have been three seconds long, in silence, in the top right-hand corner of the screen, and you would have been sat either side of you with a Hoover or vacuum cleaner. Yeah? That gives you some sense of the audience that our clients are currently buying. And that, of course, doesn't take into account our more recent adventures in digital video. As you may have heard recently, Facebook last month admitted that they had inflated the time, the average duration of watching of digital video by about 80%. That's a lot. That's a lot, right? If my wife overhears me boasting to my friends that we make love five times a week for 30 minutes, she, first of all, she's going to tell me that's not true. Uh, and then she's going to say, that's, you're lying, you're lying. And if I keep doing it for two years, which is what Facebook did on their site for two years, there is, I think, a problem with metrics and with the way things are being presented. An 80% inflation. And again, I don't feel like it was covered with anything like the vigor that perhaps it could have been. And when David Fisher, who's a very good marketer, who's the most senior marketer at Facebook, announced on Facebook, listen, we've made an error. We've overstated our average viewing figures by duration by 80%. You can imagine the pushback he got from digital agencies. These are the actual comments at the bottom of his announcement. You ready? This was the response of the digital marketers to this 80% inflation. Joshua Greer said, this will pass. Don Graham said, a very good post and a helpful explanation, David. Well done. Mike McKinley, life begins at the edge of your comfort zone. Keep pushing the team, David. Facebook delivers big-time results for those willing to embrace change. Yeah? You get the idea. We're in a completely mental world now. Yeah? If you guys had inflated your radio audience by 80% for two years, yeah? I don't think your posts would have been, keep pushing the envelope radio, guys. <laughs> I think they would have had a different tenor. So it's, you know, it's crazy. It's, it's like, again, I'm saying to my wife, oh, we make love every day for 30 minutes. And she says, you know, that's not true. But thank you for saying it because it just makes me feel great. You know what I mean? We have no critical response. Meanwhile, as all this is going on, the so-called traditional media are being described as being in a death spiral. And the problem with that is that it starts to become a self-fulfilling prophecy among clients who are influenced by perceptions. We're told repeatedly newspapers are dying. So Martin Sorrell, who I think is one of the few independent voices out there, he has a bias, of course, from an industry point of view, but I think he's straight on this one, I think he's genuinely worried. So Martin says, I think actually we're starting to see, with traditional media, particularly newspapers, a bit of a pendulum swing back. I'm not convinced. I don't think 17, the pendulum swings anywhere back. We'll see. We're continually told... The end of newspapers is upon us, interestingly by the newspapers themselves, who've done more than anyone else to destroy their own business. 
We're told about the death of television, that YouTube has already destroyed TV, that the era of TV's media dominance will come to an end in 2016, and here is the evidence, yeah? Again, this is total and utter bullshit. Indulge me because I use a, a, a very interesting data set called OSTAM, the National Panel, uh, representatively measured, independently measured, of uh, TV watching in Australia. And handily today, they'll publish their new figures for the quarter. And I, I want to warn you in advance, you've no idea how bad TV has got. They're in deep, deep trouble now because of the digital revolution. So prepare yourself. It's pretty much over for the TV channels. So if you look at the average Australian, whole population, massive sample, real-time measurement, the average Australian will, this is for video, right? Where do they watch their video in a typical month? They'll watch 2.6% of their total video on a tablet. They'll watch 3.7% of it on a smartphone. They'll watch 7.3% of it on a PC. And then they'll watch 86.4% of it on a television. That's how screwed TV is, ladies and gentlemen. They've only got 90% share of video in this country. And let's pause. That's really what they're going to say. Yeah? TV's finished. When in the history of media has a 90% platform share been deaf? It's a strange world we live in, is it not? I'm kind of being a bit rhetorical, but not much. And by the way, it's pretty much flat over the last quarters. It's coming down slightly in some demographics, going up in others. If you go back to Q2 2015, we're averaging about 90 minutes of live viewing and playback. We're now at 89.45 when you add in both playbacks. It's a rounding error. It's pretty flat, actually. Pretty flat. So, TV's knackered, as you learn. And as you learned from Umbrella a couple of months ago, radio also dead, right? You may have heard... In the Australian, free-to-air radio, the, ne the next in line to see advertising crumble. Is this the end of radio as we know it? Or is it no longer a zero-sum game? So again, let me feel your pain for a moment because I know how tough it's been for you. Let me set up an unfair contrast. Facebook in Australia with commercial radio. And let's smash your business to smithereens. So, as you know already, Facebook, 15 million weekly active users. Poor old commercial radio. Only 18 million, yeah? So what are you going to do about that? And then Facebook, eight and a half hours per week um, of active uh, Facebook time for each average user per old commercial radio, down to 13 hours, 46 minutes per week. If ever we could get these numbers off these slides and into the head of marketers, I think it would be to your benefit. I'm 100% certain they don't know it at the moment. Radio audiences are up 7% since 2010. We all know why. It's because old Dr. Death over here is living longer and tuning into radio boring for a longer period of time. <laughs> no, that's not the reason. In fact, it's absolutely not the reason. The real growth in radio over the last few years has come from the younger demographic. The 10 to 24-year-old group is up by 23% in terms of their uh, increase. How many of them are increasing their radio listening? And the old, uh, old doctor group over there is only up by about 11%. This is a very vibrant, very active, very social medium that has perhaps a need to express itself better. Now, the good news is B&T presented that information. Talked about a month ago, radio ad revenue continues to rise. And the picture they use to capture this dynamic and youthful medium says everything about how fucked you guys are. <laughs> that's, how, that's, the, that's, the, that's how they covered it, right? There can't be that many stock photos of 50s radios left, but fuck knows, they keep finding them for you guys. Hey, at least it's in color. Most of them are in black and white, right? That's how they report you guys doing well, yeah? Don't forget, radio remains among the most trusted advertising media in Australia. This is the Nielsen data from last year, showing you that there is some trust, not much, there is some trust for advertising on the digital channels. Radio, significantly more trusted than those digital channels. So ads aren't just more welcomed, they're more likely to be trusted if they're presented on radio according to Nielsen's data. Now, that's hard data to show you because when Nielsen built this report, they did something phenomenally stupid but phenomenally common. They took, as you can see here, the results of the trust data and they split them 
according to traditional, which is shown here in pink, and digital, shown in orange. They created two silos. Now, my question to you is, why the fuck would you do that? Why would you do that? And it's what's happening around our industry. You, as you well know, you are traditional. Yes? And Facebook and Google Instagram, they are digital. And these are the silos we have built. And you, as you'll see in a minute, have to get out of that silo quickly or you're in trouble as an industry like TV and newspapers. You know how this narrative plays out, yeah? The new age of digital marketing sets up a dynamic where digital is awesome, maximum people, immediate communication, versatile. And traditional media like radio, it's just shit, basically. Limited audience, bad signaling, delayed communication, it's crap. This is how clients are increasingly thinking out there. We want digital, we don't want traditional. So let me attempt to smash this, because we have to smash it. There are four very good reasons, in my opinion, why we must kill this nonsense about digital versus traditional. And we have to kill it quickly before it becomes the dominant meme within our industry. First, traditional is becoming digital. By the year 2020, more than 50% of outdoors profits will come from digital advertising. So what's going to happen then? Are we going to start calling outdoor advertising digital and putting it on the other side of the line? Even news media will do a quarter of its profits from advertising by 2020 from digital advertising only. And as you know, already in Australia, more than a quarter of Australians listen to digital radio. So if that gets to 50%, can we call radio digital? Is that okay? It's a meaningless distinction. Here's the data from America. They've just passed the point where more than half of Americans listen to digital radio. So officially, radio is digital in the States. At the same time as traditional is becoming digital, digital is going traditional. As you know, Facebook was born in 2004. That means it's older than Hamish or Andy, right? It's getting to be quite a mature medium. Guess who one of the biggest advertisers is in the world right now for TV? Google. This is their current advertising reel around the world right now. There are 56 campaigns going. So if a digital company is spending a lot of money on traditional, doesn't that make it slightly traditional? And then you've got companies like Amazon. Anyone know what Amazon's new disruptive activity is right now around America? What are they doing right now that's completely disruptive, the whole digital space? They're opening bookstores. <laughs> so, traditional is digital, digital is traditional. The thing's breaking down. In fact, it's very important to recognize that the whole thing is meaningless. My favorite thinker on media is Tom Goodwin, who's just become the global guru for Zenith, the big media agency. I love Goodwin's work. He's a genius, right? This is my favorite quote of all time. I think this is a key insight for all of us. His point, as you'll see, is it's all nonsense. He says, there is not a more meaningless divide and obsession than the notion of digital media. Media channels will once clearly distinguish a name for the physical devices that we use to consume them. Radio ads played on radios and were audio. TV ads played on TVs and were moving images. Newspaper ads were images in the paper, while outdoor ads were the images around us. In, the 20, in 2014, the naming legacy is both misleading and of no value. I listen to the radio on my phone, read the newspapers on a laptop, watch YouTube on my TV, and read magazines on my iPad. Our old media channels mean nothing yet their names survive and mislead us into artificially limited thinking. And this is what's happening with our clients right now and advertisers. They are seeing the world from a digital versus traditional point of view, which stops them seeing the potential of radio as a truly disruptive and, and, and popular uh, media for their brands. It's killing strategy. This constant debate between traditional or digital is forcing us to look at the idea that it's tactics over strategy. I have seen so many clients in the last 12 months here in Australia with literally no strategy. And I do not exaggerate. They're having debates in their marketing department about how much they're going to do Facebook and Google and whether they're going to do any traditional. They have no strategy at all. And I call it the tactification of marketing. And if it takes complete hold, radio will lose out from this. We've tried to train marketers for 20 years and we're losing the battle now because all they learn about are different tactics and different digital widgets every day. 
There are three questions that precede the choice of digital or traditional or whatever else that must be done before we do media. Who is your target segment? If more advertisers looked at their target segment and how much time they spent listening to radio, it would be distinctly in your favour. What is your brand position? Again, look at the positioning of a brand and then see which ones have a fit with which programmes. One of the great benefits of radio is its, its ability to extend the position into the editorial. But if we never get to those discussions between advertisers where we can match editorial with how they're trying to position their brands, those conversations will disappear. And finally, and worst of all, what is your communication objective? We don't have them anymore. Well, we have, you know, spend more on media, particularly digital media, but we don't have any sense of awareness. We don't have any sense of consideration, of building likelihood. And I'll tell you what's happening. In the old-fashioned funnels that we used to build, pipeline, buying models, remember those? We're all moving down the bottle of the funnel because that's where digital's taking us, yeah? And at the top end of the funnel, the awareness of these brands is beginning to diminish, which again is where radio traditionally paid a strength. We have to try and make our clients more strategic so they will stop thinking just tactically and open their minds to all the different options. I despair, I despair for Country Road, yeah? Not because it's not a great brand or got great people in it, but recently they did an experiment where they tested Facebook and discovered that if they spend a dollar on Facebook, they get $15 back on revenue. It was a nice piece of work. And as a result, the marketing director there announced we're taking a digital first approach, which means that from now on they'll start with a digital budget and they'll decide how they spend it from there. It's the end of the world because it's stupid. Now I work, disclosure, I work for big global brands that spend all of their money on digital. But they don't do it because they've got a digital first strategy. They do it because they've got a strategy and digital, in this case, works best for them. That's okay. It's not okay when we don't have any strategy and we just start with digital first. And it will close the door to more and more brands for radio if it continues. So I wrote about this this year in The Age. And I described how it was so frustrating that marketers increasingly are going digital first. And particularly they've got a digital budget before they've even looked at where they might want to spend their money. And I, admit, I did this interview with The Age from France and I was a little drunk at the time, but here you go. Let me explain something later on. If any marketer, I said in the interview, if any marketer comes to me with a pre-allocated social media marketing budget, I know they're an idiot and poorly trained. I mean it. I probably wouldn't have been that strong if I hadn't had a bottle of, of, of Bordeaux, but there you go, right? And then later on I said, the hegemonic forces, I ain't drunk, the hegemonic forces of marketing are such that it's now career-threatening to suggest I might prefer to spend my money on radio or, God forbid, print over social media. You're not allowed to say that, and I find it distasteful. So the article went out the next day, and I'm sitting there working when a certain member of the uh, social media community began to tweet about what, uh, about what she thought, or he thought, I don't know, about the article, uh, with me hashtagged in there, right? Calling marketers, marketers idiots equals the hallmark of profound insight. What is this dinosaur even doing at Melbourne? She means Melbourne Uni, my school. So I put up with that. I've had worse, you know. Next, two minutes later, honestly gobsmacked at how behind the times Mark Ritson is, he must have mad men marketing nostalgia. Still, I'm like, okay, fine, whatever. Next one. This is so embarrassing for you, Mark Ritson, and Melbourne Business School. Shockingly out of touch. And then, social media is for poorly trained idiots. Mark Ritson in B&T, please reconsider the tenure of this clown. And I thought, right, fuck it, I'm not having that anymore. Because <laughs> I hadn't said that, right? Anyway, so I wrote back, plan A, please read the article properly before you critique it. Social media budgets. I work for companies that spend all their money on social, but it's the pre-allocated budget exclusively for social that I think is stupid. You don't get it. She tweets back, I have read it, you presumptuous, arrogant fool. <laughs> and I said, yes, but you don't understand it. She doesn't. She really doesn't. You spend all your money on social. You spend all on radio. I come from an old place called the 1980s. You know what we did in the 1980s? We were media neutral. Imagine that. We came up with a strategy, and then we picked the best tools that would deliver the job. And you could have an integrated solution if you spent every dollar on radio as long as you considered all the tools. That's not what this shit's about. 
This is nonsense, poorly trained nonsense. An allocated budget before you've done your strategy, it's bad form. Really, Mark, do I not understand it because I don't share your madman ideas, you arrogant prick? <laughs> and then some other guy that I didn't even realise was following us tweeted in, I love it when brands lose their shit. <laughs> Final point about why we have to kill digital and traditional. It's about and and not versus. And, and that's a key point for 2017. And this is my biggest point, I, I would say. We have to stop saying, is radio better than Facebook or is Facebook better than TV? For two reasons. First, it's over, man. When you've got 7% of the pie, you're a small player. You don't win anything here by fighting with the big boys now. What you win is by integrating, yeah? And there's good news for radio, as we'll see. So, let, let me tell you a little formula that I've used for years and works every time. A times B is always going to be greater than 2A or 2B. What the hell does that mean? It means that if you take two tools, let's say radio and let's say Facebook, and you split your budget between them, you'll almost always get a better return than if you put all of it on Facebook or all of it on radio. The synergies, the synergies of these brands and these media work beautifully. And I've never seen this not work. And it was tested by the IPA, who looked at what would happen if, rather than spending all your money on newspaper or all your money on social, they looked at about 75 different cases in the UK, the biggest advertising body in the UK. You actually spread the money across a combination, in this case, of newspaper and social? And the answer was you more than doubled the return in the 78 cases they studied versus the 50 that didn't. It was a very big study. And it proves this point of synergy of and, not, either. Now, that's important because radio plays better with others than anyone else. And you're small enough now on the global and, and Australian scene that you're going to win big by doing that. And there's some great data from 2015 that you guys collected that proves the point. If you take a TV campaign and add a significant portion of radio to that TV campaign, it's going to generate an incremental 21% uplift in the effect of the campaign. Similarly, if you add radio to any kind of online or digital stuff, it's going to add a 23% return. Radio plays well with others. And the secret for radio for me would be I'd be playing it as the great multiplier, the great tool that works well with others. So, preparing for 2017, here's what I anticipate and what I recommend in what will be a fascinating year for Australian media. First, it's going to get extraordinarily bumpy. There's no doubt about it. This will be the most volatile year in any of our careers, and the reason should be simple. When two relatively new players in Facebook and Google are about to take almost half of all advertising spend in Australia and they didn't exist 10 years ago, that volatility is, is unavoidable. But it's starting to squeeze now. News media and TV and radio are increasingly being compacted by these forces now. So we're getting to a point where it's pushback time or integration time, it's going to be bumpy. And by the way, the other digital channels that aren't Google and Facebook, they're running out of money. So they're also bumping around here. Things are going to get frenetic. So expect it to be tricky. Don't let anyone put you or your brand or your station or your, or your medium of radio into the traditional bucket. Help me. Every time I see it on social media, in the media, in a presentation, I'll always say, excuse me, I have a question. The fuck does traditional mean? Yeah? It's bad, lazy thinking. We're not the same as print, we're not the same as TV or cinema or outdoor. Traditional means nothing. Push back against it if you can. Emphasize the simplicity and independence of GFK. One of the things that's going to happen next year is the fact that Facebook and Google are grading their own homework and clearly getting it wrong and not showing us the answers will become more and more a source of tension. The transparency and simplicity of radio metrics should not be underestimated. The more simple and transparent you are, the better you're going to be. Challenge the numbers from your digital rivals. Most of them are wobbly. Some of them aren't even true. Push, squeeze on those numbers because some of them, frankly, need to be pushed and no one's pushing at the moment. It took two years to find that mistake in, in, in Facebook's video number. It was sitting there all that time. It's a, it's a simple arithmetic calculation. But, and this is something that I probably can learn better from you, 
Play the and game rather than the versus game. Radio wins when it works with rather than against. And that would suit, I think, the long-term potential of the medium. But I would stress, and I've seen this in the UK and also in, I think, Scandinavia, don't sell radio like it's social media. Yeah? It's too good for that. Don't give up the ghost. To integrate with digital is great, but don't say, well, we're also a social media. We can show you metrics like social media. That would be a strategic mistake. Radio's strength is its unique differences from those other media. So don't start presenting it like you're a social media. Radio has an amazing heritage and a strong future. Play radio as a separate uh, entity. Remember how good for brands radio is. Remember how it fits much more naturally with brands, how it's a natural medium for brands to work their magic with editorial, with reach, with interaction, and with proximity to the place of purchase. These are great things, and if the digital tools could have them, they would surely make more from them. And finally, and most importantly of all, remember that you're definitely not fucked. Thank you. Okay, well, that was a call to arms and um, some really interesting stats and challenges. We've got time for a few questions. If anyone has anything they'd like to ask Mark or ask him to expand on before our next session. Question over there. Do we have a mic? Um, thanks for your presentation. I just want to challenge you on one thing. You, you glossed over it pretty quickly, the um, television numbers. Yep. Because you're saying that we're watching screens, not necessarily watching what we define as television. Um, can you give us some more insight into what's really going on with particularly free-to-air? Yeah, look, I think it's a fair, it's a fair pushback. I, I think free-to-air is in some form of, of decline within the TV set, to your point, sir. Um, Having said that, I don't, again, I don't have the numbers handy, and, and they'll come out in the media today anyway with OzTam. It's not as extreme as it appears, and, and don't quote me on this because this might not be the right number, but if you look at Netflix, uh, Apple, and the other share of that watching, that 80-odd that percent, it's only about 7%. So that's still a significant chunk, but nonetheless, you know, the free-to-air channels are, are still, to some degree, holding on to that audience, though it's a fair pushback. It is in somewhat of a decline. But, you know, I think there's two lines here, as we say often in newspapers as well. There's the line of the audience, and then there's the line of the advertising sentiment. And there's no doubt that the line of the audience for terrestrial TV, for news media, has been in decline over these last five years. I would argue, at least in news media, in many cases, it's now flattening out. Uh, some uh, take the Australian. I, I work for the Australian a little bit, but the Australian's actually up this year in terms of overall readership. But you're right, they're in decline. I'm less involved in that as I am in the mentality and perception of advertisers because each and every time we ask them to estimate what they think is the audience decline versus what it actually is, even though there is a decline, it's far greater. And what that's doing is it's affecting the perception. And so, yeah, you're right. I think we, have to, we should be clear that there's two areas where we should play a straight bat with TV. With the, the terrestrial channels, they are in more decline than simple TV screen watching would suggest. And among that younger demographic, sub-24, there is a, a marked decline versus five years ago of watching TV among that group. The big question for that one, which we don't have, is clearly that decline is real, how much of them, when they get older, pregnant, uh, you, know, uh, you know, old, um, older, you know, a house and a mortgage and a partner and kids and, and depressing stuff like that, how many of them will give up and sit on, on the sofa and watch TV? We just don't know that yet. So that, that's fair. I think, you know, TV's not rosy, but, you know, let's come back to that central thing. If we look at all video in Australia this month, nine out of ten... Uh, videos, that's not even fair, 9 out of 10 minutes will be watched on the television set. Some more with Netflix and Apple TV for sure, but nonetheless, it's still TV. And I think if you, if you really push me to it, what will eventually happen, and I have no evidence of this, is the large digital uh, channels will be acquiring TV channels very soon. 
I, I worked out that Google can afford one of our TV channels, one of our terrestrial channels here. It would take them a day and a half to earn the money to buy it, according to its market capitalization. So I think that may be the step we go to. But I think this, this trope of TV is dead and newspapers are dying overstates it. But there are problems, and I think it's a fair pushback. Question at the back there, as a lady. Sorry, am I doing your? You've, you've you talked about oh, no, no, no. You, the the it. marketers and the the brands and what their perceptions are. Yeah. But a lot of them get their perceptions from their media agencies, their buyers, yes. and their creatives. So, and theoretically, particularly from the media agency's point of view, they should be very interested in the statistics and the research that you've just put up. How do we talk to them and to get them to tell our story to their advertising clients? How, how honest do you want me to be? Fuck is honest. <laughs> okay. So, it's a great question. Um, we, we, we're always... It's the, it's the question, right? In all the media companies I've worked for, the question comes up, how much to the advertiser, how much to the media agency... We think there's a, we're doing some research for one of my clients, and we think it's a, it, it varies, obviously. So here's the problem, and you already know what it is. Your average media planner is 27 years old. He's male, predominantly. He lives in Sydney, occasionally in Melbourne. He's never read a newspaper. He doesn't listen to the radio. He, he does have a TV, but he claims that he doesn't. And he is already living the dream of the future, right? So the first problem you've got is they just don't have any sensitivity to um, the power of some of these other media. There is a significant um, suggestion that the profitability of media like radio is a significant problem too. So, um, you know, I have heard that there are certain tools that are more profitable than others and radio is not in that list. Obviously, there are certain digital tools which offer significant... Uh, financial advantages in terms of margin and, and, and circ commissions and other traditional media outdoors always had a strong performance in that area in my experience too so um, I, I think that you know they're the key issues I, I, I don't know what we do about that I'm working on it with a client at the moment I'm, I'm doing some research as we speak to look at the media consumption of a media planner his personal consumption how much it correlates with his media buying irrespective of the client and we're just trying to get to what do we do there. But it's an intractable problem, and I think you're absolutely right. It's part of this. I think there are three problems you face in radio. One, the media planner that just doesn't... Look, most of these media planners are very talented, very smart people. They have no training in marketing and no training in media, the new generation. They just come up with dashboards and toolkits in digital, right? If they're sub-27, ask the older media guys about them. They're wonderfully smart, but they didn't come up through a traditional path. Second, you've got your client. Marketers now are, you know, all marketers are paranoid. They don't know what they're doing. And the look on their faces when you recommend radio as an option is best described as, you know, unpalatable. It's like, you must be fucking crazy. Radio, what are you? Fucking, you know? It's not 1962, mate, you know? So we have that perception gap with the advertisers. And here's the other one. We have a real problem with the C-suite. So you would think the CMOs, CEOs, etc., are the ones that would come in and say, hey, come on, let's just look at this. But if you're over 55 and male, which most of the C-suite are, the one biggest concern you have other than the share price is looking out of touch. So I've seen this many times. They're the ones going, no, 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 keep it all in Facebook and Google because I don't want to look like I'm a 55-year-old man who doesn't understand any of this, which is patently the case, right? All those three factors are part of this problem we face. And I don't see any of them going away. So I don't know if that helps you. But we have, a, we have an almighty struggle to turn around this perception of the numbers. I would say one thing. I think the way radio is presented today is great. But you, are, you could still be more transparent. I think there's lovely detailed data. I think what Oztam sort of has is just the power of your numbers in terms of reach and youth is very, very strong, but it's not easy to get to. Um, I'd make it even easier. So thank you very much. That was um, fantastic, fascinating, and challenging. <laughs>